We're going to jump in and 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 really kind of discuss some broader trends in the market. Um, you know, we we obviously saw a lot of interesting technology today, and I'm I'm curious before we kind of jump into what we're all seeing in the market. Have you you know, and maybe this is a question for both of you as you're evaluating startups and as you're looking at some of these companies, has that evaluation criteria changed at all in the last, you know, nine to 12 months? Are you still kind of focused on the same things that you've always been focused on? Yeah. Yeah. I, I was, <laughs> you go ahead, you're Andy. Start, you start. <laughs> go for it. Um, I think for me as an angel investor, um, nothing is really any different. So, you know, I think there's a, um, a nuance between angels and institutional investors. Angels are writing checks out of their own bank accounts. And so we're not really answerable to a, a whole series of LPs that have, you know, particular um, strategies for what they're looking for out of an investment. So um, for me, nothing is any different. Yeah, I kind of concur with that as well. I think, um, a good business case, a good business, a good management team is good when the times are very good and when the times are tough. And I think they stay calm when the times are great. They don't, you know, throw around money. And equally, when the times are tough, they don't panic. And I think um, that's why I think a lot of the metrics that we use will be the same um, throughout the, you know, the, the, the various cycles. What I would say, you know, more in general, working with institutional investors and also with, you know, maybe strategic investors, there is more rigor around data and the quality of data being received and also just, you know, more focus on the path to profitability and, and just a clear business case. But, you know, I would have argued you you need that all along. It's just, you know, now the hurdle is a bit higher. Yeah. yeah. Well, good. So let's look at some of the technologies that we saw today and the problems that uh, startups are working to solve. So we saw a pretty decent variety of uh, virtual reality to to scaling complex itineraries to blended travel solutions to you know digitizing as we always do we see lots of digitizing across the customer journey and also b to b to b tech that you know is is increasing efficiency so maybe just kind of thinking about the broader ecosystem you know what are some of the areas that that you know the two of you are seeing and maybe andy i'll I'll kind of start with with you what where are some of the biggest opportunities today? Yeah, I mean, I think you touched on a lot of them. I'd say, you know, the kind of two buckets. Um, I mean, this is very generalist, right? But but there's those buckets who are kind of, of of great companies, some of which I just heard before, which are solving specific problems in the value chain of travel, be it in the payment stack or be it in, you know, just making the companies in the travel industry that little bit more efficient. And actually, I would argue those can be fantastic companies if, you know, if they're able to scale across the industry because, when you're partnering with a high volume com company, you can you can become you know great fairly quickly. Obviously, you know the pain point has to be clear enough and has to be big enough. But equally, I think we're seeing you know companies that are um, still revolutionizing and coming up with something that has not been the case before. I mean, there there are obviously always going to be by definition few of these companies because you know it, it takes you know to find the the next Airbnb. That's you know that that's going to be a it, it's a miracle, but. You know, we, for example, we work with a company called Kite in the U.S. that 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 does delivery of cars um, to your doorstep, and I think it's those sorts of companies that are still providing quite unique approaches, maybe even to mature markets, to mature industries like the car rental sector, but a very different approach to what we've seen by the legacy players. So I think there's a, you know, both those companies looking for more efficiency and helping the value chain of the travel industry, but also those who are completely just rethinking the problem. Tara, how about you? Yeah, yeah, I, I think so. One of the things I've been thinking about a lot since the pandemic is, um, you know, travel is already, it's an enormous market, but I, I still think there's opportunities to make it bigger. And so, you know, some of the digital twin um, things that we've seen are really interesting to me from the perspective of, um, you know, I think of somebody like Wheel of the World, for example, which is one of my portfolio companies, and they're doing some really great things in surfacing more um, options for accessible travel. Right. And, and so looking at how they're thinking about accessible travel, it's not just people in a wheelchair, it's people with all sorts of, you know, different abilities and how they need to get around. And so I, I could see something like some of the digital twin technologies really being helpful for that end of the market to say, OK, well, maybe somebody in this particular type of wheelchair can't navigate this particular hiking trail, but somebody with a different type of disability would be able to. So right now there's a lot of kind of binary stuff that I think unnecessarily locks down certain elements of the market that I think could be opened up with with more technology around around things like that and you know forms of payment too right I think 
buy now, pay later is interesting, but I, I don't, I don't love that because I think it incents some of the wrong behavior, but I, I've seen some things that are more like save now, travel later. Right. And so things like that, I think could be interesting for expanding the market for a segment of, you know, the, the demographic segment that's probably younger and doesn't have, you know, a credit card to buy, you know, a $400 plane ticket readily today, but they might be able to space that out over time. So things like that are really interesting to me. And, and I'm starting to see more of those opportunities come up. Yeah. Save, save now, travel later is, is tapping a little bit more into, into yeah. that loyalty piece. Right. So they're able to kind of yeah. do a little bit more than just, you know, put something on layaway and, right. um, you know, eventually pay, pay, pay it off over time. So uh, Kara, I want to ask you, um, I know you weren't up at, at you know, 5.30 or, or 5 o'clock your time, so you might have missed some of the Asia Pac startups, but just in general, was there, you know, something that we missed today um, we didn't see from these startups? And I know we saw, you know, towards the tail end, we saw a little bit of companies that are that are basically fully focused on generative AI, but are you surprised that we didn't see more applications of of AI, I know we're still super early, at least in that, that, you know, GAI cycle, but what are some things that maybe you expected to see more of that, that, you know, that you didn't see today? Yeah, I think the two things that, that I'm still kind of keeping an eye out, um, one is, is kind of in the mobility space. And so kite, um, the, the car, there's another kite as well. So there's two different kites, but the, the kite mobility one is kind of interesting because I think there's, there's, um, you know, and that may be kind of less of a travel specific thing, but I put it in the category of Uber where you could use it for non-travel use cases as well as travel use cases. But I think the idea of kind of fractional mobility is is interesting. And I think there's ways that that could be explored a little more than, than it has been so far. And I think that has implications for like cities and municipalities that, you know, are a little different than how we typically think of travel startups going to market. Um, but that's that's interesting to me. And I think that the category, the whole like universal idea, universal wallet, decentralized decentralized identification is interesting. We started to see some of that during the pandemic because you, you had so many um, requirements for how you could travel, right? And so those kind of fell away, I think, a little bit. But I, I think there's still a lot of opportunity for that, that um, I know there's some companies poking around in, in those areas, but um, you know, I, I, I don't feel like I've seen as much of them recently. So let's jump a little bit into the kind of fundraising and, and M and A environment. So we've, you know, we follow this quite closely. Um, Mike Coletta presented some trends uh, from our state of startups database at Focus Right Europe, and some of the big trends. Obviously, you know, valuations have taken quite a quite a huge hit. Um, that led to a, you know, we saw a pretty sizable jump in acquisitions in 2022, and and even into the first half of of 2023. Uh, venture funding has, you know, dried up to some degree, although we're starting to see some of that come back. Debt funding skyrocketed, you know, leading to some challenges here in the banking system in the U.S. Um, so maybe, Andy, are, are things are things starting to to free up a bit? Uh, what what are you what are you seeing on on your side? Um, yeah, no, I think the trends we see in Europe are very similar. Probably, you know, they're they're reflecting the global trends a bit, but but you know, um, definitely, I, I would say. I'm not actually that convinced that it will change as rapidly as unfortunately we wanted to change and things are going to free up. I just think um, for the near future, we're still, you know, planning with a high interest rate environment. If you take the UK, you know, it's one of the, the countries with the highest inflation rates and it's just, you know, continuing to go up. And and so the kind of, you know, the returns you can get in safe spots compared to the returns that you will get from, from putting in venture, you know, it's, it just makes that hurdle a little bit higher and it really takes much more, you know, of a brave investor, let's say, to especially in the travel category to come in. But that said, I do think, you know, again, when you talk to the right investors who, you know, are in for the long term um, and really understand the value proposition, they understand that the travel industry is one that's going to continue to grow and it's just going to change over time. You know, things like you know, environmental you know, friendliness of, of, of the travel industry, things like the trends that, you know, were just mentioned around being more inclusive, things around different mobility forms. There's so many different areas that are growing. And I think, you know, a smart investor would see that actually now is a great time to double down because, you know, there might be somewhere you could get them for attractive um, um, valuations, let's put it that way. Um, and, and so I do think you see the juxtaposition between those companies who are just staying out. And we have a lot of those, unfortunately, who are just saying, no, we're not touching travel right now. And, um, you know, it's too risk, uh, too high risk for us. But we also see some who are saying, listen, now's the time to look at it because 
we do believe in it for the long term. So Kara, yeah. that this doesn't impact you quite as much on the earlier phase, but anything that anything that you're you're seeing in particular? Um, yeah, I mean, I think you know, valuations were not rational for for a while. So I think, you know, startups and founding team needs to be mindful that, you know, we're kind of coming back to normal. That was not normal. So this is kind of more the new normal. So, you know, reset your baseline for what you expect there. Um, you know, I don't focus too much on valuations. I, I think, you know, the, the best thing I can see from these early stage teams is like, just focus on building your product and getting usage and getting tractions and uh, traction and showing some revenue potential. And, you know, your business will resolve itself when it comes time to raise that next round. So, um, it's really just, you know, the same kind of discipline that we should have been having all along is, is more important now. Great. All right. So I want to, I want to jump into a virtual speed round and then we're going to, we're going to provide, uh, we're going to share some advice, uh, to these startups that pitch today. So virtual speed round, basically I'll throw out a phrase, uh, and you'll respond with a word, uh, or a short sentence, and then we'll do a little bit of this or that towards the end. So Andy, AI driven trip inspiration startups very relevant but is now the right time question mark <laughs> Sarah, b2b or b2c oh b2b i thought you would consumers, <laughs> you consumers would. scare me I'm, I'm a bit not a dna kind of person <laughs> yes indeed andy uh startups uh who are in empowering the creator economy nice power to the people <laughs> <laughs> Kara, business travel startups. Uh, opportunity. Uh, Andy, blockchain. Yet to be proven in travel. I hope it will be. Yeah. Uh, Kara, hospitality startups. Um, we didn't see that bag. many of them today. Yeah, we yeah, didn't, yeah. Mixed, we, mixed we, yeah, we've seen a ton of them over the years. And and mm -hmm. uh yeah, we didn't see a, a we didn't see all that many of them today. Uh, Andy, uh incubators and accelerators. Sorry, one or the other or both? Or, no, or, just you uh, know, their their role and value in the in the ecosystem. Uh it's like the lifeblood of um helping uh get the travel um uh, venture world going. It's uh, without that, we wouldn't have the second. Sorry, that yeah, was a big no, fully, fully agree. Um, Kara, access to funding. Complicated. <laughs> More complicated uh, than it needs to be. <laughs> All right, Andy, here's, here's a little this or that. Operating a global travel brand like Expedia or TUI or investing in startups. Oh, depends on how much hair you have left on your hair. <laughs> no. did, you, um, did, no. did you lose your hair from uh, operating a global travel brand? Oh, that's... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I think, um, listen, the, the beautiful, amazing places to learn. You have to, yeah. you know, it's, it's great to learn the trade. Yeah. And Kara, on, on a similar note, uh, OTA, uh, corporate travel, or free agent investment and advisor? Where where do you prefer <laughs> to be? <laughs> uh, well, I would, I would say... Um, free agent investor and advisor, because I get to tap into both of the other two when I, when I see something interesting. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So um, we're going to kind of go into an advice clinic. So uh, Andy, maybe one piece of, of advice to startups who are, who are selling into, into larger corporations. And I'll give you about 45 mm -hmm. seconds for this. One. 45 seconds. So what I would say is, you know, usually like to Kara's point, you know, if it's a great startup, they will have spent a lot of time on product market fit and, you know, getting the customer um, experience, you know, spot on. What we notice when when it comes to selling to more mature companies is that um, for some businesses, the, the P&L, the balance sheet, the um, kind of let's call it the boring stuff can be all over the place. And I just advise everyone to have, you know, maybe it's a friend, maybe it's someone else, someone who's just really good at numbers and finance and planning just to come in and an accountant basically come in early on and get everything on a stable footing because it will make your life so much easier when you're trying to um, negotiate um, with, with a mature company who has all of that in place. That's great. Great advice. Uh, Kara, I know you've spent quite a bit of time helping startups as well as helping larger corporations kind of bring those two elements together. Anything that you wanted to share with startups or even with corporates that are tuning into? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, I think, 
for startups and, and big companies trying to work together, it's really important to have a, a, a pretty clear process, right? So startups, you, you need to have your ducks in a row. You need to have, you know, your financials are important. You need to really understand the nuances of your product and the value prop for that specific team within the bigger company. You can't try to solve all their problems. So really be deliberate about, about the process and your pitch. And I think for the larger companies, understand that you need to operate on startup time, not your typical vendor procurement timeline. Yeah, that's a, a, a certainly a good one. So, all right, one one more comment from each of you, just to kind of put a wrap on on the conversation. Um, you know, what what are some opportunities? What are some things that you're you're bullish about? Um, how do you feel about kind of the state of travel startups today? And maybe I'll start with you, Kara. Yeah, I, there's there's still so much opportunity, and it's um, you know my focus, like I said, is is more on the B two B side, and I I think there's a lot of interesting potential for um, rethinking how travel is kind of uh, presented, right, and the whole shopping and inspiration and everything else. And I love to see some of the the younger demographic, the younger millennials and Gen Z, and the creator economy kind of bring these new ways of of shopping and, and planning and booking because I think. Um, you know, one one comment I heard recently from a a, a group of younger folks, they're like, "What? Why would we use a booking engine like that? So why why are you making me fill out this form like an old Scantron? Well, they don't know what Scantron is, but you get the point. <laughs> like that's not how we think about things. It's all video driven. It's very image forward, and I, I think that's really a, a paradigm shift for how we're thinking about travel going forward. So that's that's exciting to see. How about you, Andy? Yeah, I love that because, you know, I also that's why I think someone mentioned it before, just have people from outside of the industry come in and from different, you know, generations work together and just disrupt what we've been doing for so many years. And yeah, you're absolutely right. Come up with something different. I, I'd i say in general, there's I, we've seen a lot of opportunity, A, with companies that are just totally doing something different, but for a, a, a niche that already exists. So I mentioned Kite, but you know, we're also working with a company called Halal Bookings that just focuses on the Muslim travel world. And they do such a great job at serving customers with specific requirements. And the same can apply, be applied to any sort of big niche. So, you know, lots of space, even in, you know, mature markets to, to be uh, to disrupt. But then, you know, as, as we've heard on the call, there's a lot of startups just solving problems that are real. And they not, might not be the most sexy problem, but actually they can create a lot of value for the companies they're selling it for. So I'm bullish on both sides. And I think I'm also very bullish on the fact that there's still so many new travel startups coming through the door because it's just a fun industry to be in and everyone wants to travel. So it's not going away anytime soon, despite what people no, are saying. That's <laughs> for sure. Well, great. Thank you both.